This is the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com. My name is Todd DeWalt, and it's my job to help you, the construction business owner and leader, eliminate chaos and maximize profit. So this episode, we're going to go down a rabbit hole a little bit and talk about profit bleeds. The episode I did a few months back, I believe it was episode number 156, I talked about some profit bleeds that cause busy contractors to lose money. And we're not going to go through those profit bleeds in detail, but a few of them were schedule overruns, rework, supply chain issues, subcontractor inefficiencies. There were some profit bleeds that are really the root cause of why you're not making as much money as you should, or if you're losing money. And I probably got more response from that podcast episode than any other episode I've done in the last couple of years. But go check that out if you're like, man, I'm that sounds like me. I'm busier than ever, but I'm not making enough money or maybe I'm losing money. Then go check out episode 156 of the podcast to find out about those eight profit bleeds. But in this episode, I'm going to go a layer or two deeper because since I've been talking to lots and lots of contractors about these profit bleeds, I've realized that there are underlying causes of profit bleeds. And if you really want to make these profit bleeds go away, if you really want to increase profitability, eliminate chaos, then you have to get to the underlying issues. So that's what we're going to talk about in this episode. And I have about, let's see, eight underlying issues below the surface of your profit bleeds. And here we go. The first few are mindset issues. So I once heard a saying that self-awareness is like hugging a porcupine. The closer you get, the more uncomfortable it becomes. So you're probably going to hug a porcupine or two here because we're going to talk about you, all right? And the first underlying issue behind these profit bleeds is the, it's a mindset that I call, quote, as little and as late as possible. The as little and as late as possible mindset, okay? This relates to getting leads. We'll get as few leads as possible. We will get just enough sales in the door to make things run as little as possible. Do as little as possible, as late as possible to make things work from a sales perspective. We'll hire somebody as late as possible. We'll hire somebody at the lowest skill level possible. When it comes to systems, we'll put in the bare minimum amount of systems. And in, when it comes to <laughs> systems, this mindset says, let's put a half ass system in place. We'll cobble something together and we'll use it until it breaks. And then it's really hard to put a new system in when you're dealing with a broken system. Okay, so that's the as little as possible and as late as possible. And then planning. This mindset says, let's get the job. We'll just get out there and get started, and then we'll figure it out from there. We'll do as little planning as possible, as late as possible. Buying equipment, buying tools, we'll wait until things break, and then we'll, we'll buy them. We don't do preventative maintenance. We'll just wait until things break and then deal with the consequence. When it comes to sending out invoices, when we realize we can't make payroll or we need money, then we'll send out invoices. And then we'll send out invoices as late as possible, only when we have to. And then we'll go collect those invoices when we need money. Oh shit, I can't make payroll next Tuesday. I have to go collect some money. That's the as little as possible as late as possible mindset. It probably applies to a lot of other things, but those are some of the most common things that show up. Number two is, and actually these next two mindsets are probably connected. In fact, these first three are probably all connected somehow. Number two is the scarcity mindset. And I'll read something that I found that puts it pretty succinctly. One of the keys to success in life is learning to forego instant gratification for long-term rewards. When we stay home to work on a college essay instead of going out with our friends, 
or put money toward retirement savings when we could spend it on clothing and fancy meals out, or in our case, fancy trucks and tools and expensive bourbon, we're betting that the long-term payoff will be worth the short-term sacrifice. Troublingly, research has shown that low-income people are more likely to make short-term decisions, like borrowing at excessive rates. Think about the payday loans, right? Making short-term decisions that make them worse off in the long run. A study that was done and published in Science Magazine explains that this kind of short-term decision-making is the direct result of poverty. When we have limited resources, our brains adopt a, quote, scarcity mindset. All of our attention is directed to figuring out how to make rent, how to buy enough groceries, how to make payroll, how to get through the week, which means that we have a harder time making decisions that involve long-term thinking. This makes it even harder for people to escape the cycle of poverty. So this scarcity mindset, I think, is a, it's a, there's a chicken and an egg situation going on here. The, when things go bad, there are two, two potential cases here. When things go bad, you get into a scarcity mindset because you're just trying to survive. You are resource limited, you're just trying to survive, and then you start making really short-term decisions, which puts you into a downward spiral. Now, the other way to look at this is that having a propensity for only making short-term decisions puts you into a scarce situation. So one leads to the other, and they typically end up in a downward spiral. So the other way the scarcity mindset shows up is thinking that there's just not enough out there in the world. There's not enough work. There are are no good employees. There are no good customers. Nobody wants to do anything good. Everybody's out to screw me. There's not enough out there that you have to take from somebody in order to get, that it's a a zero-sum game. That's the scarcity mindset. And there are a couple of quotes that, that I've seen that apply that you need to think about if you're thinking, yeah, well, yeah, that's me. It, it is a tough world. It is an unfriendly universe. Everybody's out to get each other. It's dog eat dog. It's, it's cutthroat. Then I, I want to share a couple of quotes, one of which comes from Napoleon Hill, who wrote Think and Grow Rich. And he said this, your thoughts tend to clothe themselves in reality. Another way to say that is you attract whatever you think about. So if you see the world and you think about the world in a scarcity mindset, then you're going to be right. You are going to live in a scarce world because that's the way you see the world. So this is a tough one. And I'll get to one thing you can do if you're struggling with the scarcity mindset. And I can speak from experience because I spent a long time thinking, man, everybody's out to get me. Think nothing I do works out. I'm a screw up. This is going to be hard, all of these sorts of things. But you have to understand the law of attraction. I'm not going to go into details on this, but it may sound a little woo-woo, a little foofy, but it works. It's the way things work. You don't learn it in school, but I've interviewed enough people and listened to interviews from enough successful people and read enough books from successful people that it's true. The law of attraction is true. All right, so that's the scarcity mindset. Next, which is very closely related, is the poverty mindset. All right, I'm going to read something else, another excerpt from an article about this that puts it pretty well. Most business people know their mindsets play major roles in their successes. They may not realize, however, that perceptions of money and wealth could also influence their decisions, whether in the scope of their enterprises or their personal lives. Some people have a poverty mindset while others uphold an abundance mindset. Let's look at how to tell the difference, plus some tips for breaking free from a poverty mindset. The first thing to clarify regarding the poverty definition or the poverty mindset definition is that it's not about how much money a person has in their bank accounts. It's entirely due to thoughts and perceptions, which in turn shape someone's decisions and beliefs. Someone with a poverty mindset sees a surplus in resources as an opportunity for increased consumption. Let me say that again. Someone with a poverty mindset sees a surplus in resources as an opportunity for increased consumption, and they often center their efforts on making immediate 
positive changes. In contrast, a person with a rich or abundance mentality focuses on using the excess to create momentum that causes future gains. I like to call this the resource or the resource or reward mentality. How do you look at the things you have in your life? How do you look at the money? Let's say you you have a good year and suddenly you you have lots of money in the bank, you have a growing business, you have more influence, whatever it is, whatever you have more of, are you viewing that as a reward or a resource? People with a poverty mentality tend to look at excess or a surplus in money as a reward, and they squander it. People with an abundance or a rich mentality look at an excess of money as a resource to do more work. Ah, Now I can invest this money. I can hire people. I can grow my company. I can buy a piece of equipment. I can invest it into something that will give me a long-term gain. People with a poverty mindset tend to take an excess of money or an excess of anything and see it as a reward and spend it on themselves for something that has a very short-term gain, not long-term. Similarly, the rich versus poor mentality causes a difference in priorities. The rich mindset prizes options that keep paying off long after the initial investment. Someone with a poverty mentality, though, primarily seeks investments that reward them quickly, but may not continue generating profits over a long period of time. The poverty mindset may also discourage someone from forming enduring relationships or attending events or investing time into something like networking. Thus, such a person could have more difficulty finding other business professionals to rely on or have a community for help getting out of tough situations because, in in summary, the poverty mentality is connected to short-term thinking. So before I go any further, here's the answer to the scarcity mindset, probably to the poverty mindset as well, and it's one word, gratitude. If you're dealing with scarcity, if you're dealing with anxiety, if you're dealing with frustration with what you have and you're just never satisfied with what you have, then gratitude is the answer. And what that actually looks like really specifically is this is something that I do. I've heard from dozens of other people, talked to lots of my coaching clients who have done this, spend a few minutes every day just writing down things that you're grateful for. Research has shown when you spend a few minutes in gratitude, it it quickly rewires your brain because it makes you start looking at the positive. Listen, it's easy to find the negative things, especially if you're dealing in construction and especially if you own a business. But when you start to show gratitude, it will it will seem like the people around you change. It will seem like your customers change. It will seem like your employees get better because you start looking for and focusing on the good things instead of the negative. I can tell you it will change, it'll change your life. And this is it's this is how I start my coaching calls with my clients. Let's talk about wins. Tell me some good things. This is one of the very first things I advise people to do that I work with is start a gratitude journal. It is incredibly simple, but incredibly powerful. I cannot emphasize that. All right, so those are the mindsets. How prickly are you feeling right now? Have you hug that porcupine of self-awareness? If not, here's another one for you. Micromanagement is another underlying root cause of profit bleeds. What does micromanagement look like? Well, here's what it sounds like. If you hear yourself saying these things or you sense people on your team saying these things, then you have a micromanager on your hands. Statements like, I have to be the best at this. I am the best fill in the blank. I'm the best estimator. I'm the best salesperson. I'm the best concrete finisher. I'm the best mechanic. I'm the only, I'm the only one who can handle this. I'm the only one who can do my bookkeeping. I'm the only one who can manage projects. I'm the only one who can deal with situations. Nobody can do it like me. Micromanagers have a fixed mindset. I'm sure I've talked about this in the past, but a fixed mindset says you can't change. A micromanager looks at the people that they're managing and says, this person will never change. They can't grow. They can't get better at something. They can't develop skills. They take a snapshot of the person. 
when they first meet them, and that's the way they always are. So think about that. Think about a leader, business owner, who's, who has a fixed mindset toward their people. Are they going to train them? Are they ever going to delegate to them? Will they ever trust them to do things? No, because they don't think it's possible for somebody to change. One of the other things about micromanagers that's really, really bad, really hurtful, really, uh, it's just, it's sinister almost, is that micromanagers are threatened by the success or the growth of other people. Micromanagers and or people with a fixed mindset are threatened by the success or the growth of other people. Have you ever worked for a boss who was threatened by your success and you felt like they were intimidated by you? You were dealing with a micromanager. So now think about your attitude. Let's grab that porcupine and think about the people on your team. Are there people on your team or that manage or that manage you or you manage or your peers and you are threatened by their success? And you see them as a threat to you. That's a symptom of being a micromanager and having a fake mindset. So here's how this plays out. Micromanagers cause profit bleeds. This micromanagement mindset causes profit bleeds because you will never attract somebody who's better than you. Maybe you'll attract them, but you will, you will scare them away subconsciously because you're threatened by their success if you're a micromanager. You'll never keep good people. And micromanagement is, in my experience, rooted in insecurity. And insecure leaders are huge problems, huge problems. We'll we'll talk more about insecurity and confidence in a few more minutes. All right, now let's talk about number four. The number, item number four on this list is, is the gaps in your systems. Okay, the gaps in your systems, gaps in your agreements, gaps in your designs. And when I'm talking about gaps, I'm talking about there are these... Let's talk about an agreement. Let's say you have a contract with a client to do X amount of work, but then you subcontract that to somebody and you don't, there's a gap between your subcontract and your contract with the owner. That's a gap. That's a risk that you're carrying. If you don't assign that risk properly in your subcontract agreements, you have a gap and that's an opportunity for profit bleed. Gaps in your design are that this is where rework comes in and unsolicited charity, which is change order work that you do for free. They come from gaps in the design, gaps in agreements, also gaps in planning. If your planning isn't where it should be, then you're going to have profit bleeds. Also gaps in your customer's expectations. If you enter into an agreement with somebody and they're expecting one thing, and there's a gap between their expectations and what you're providing, then again, you're looking at a potential risk of doing work twice, rework, doing work free, unsolicited charity, not getting paid for something, having missed expectations, bad customer experience, bad reviews, all of these sorts of gaps in your trade partner operations. If you don't have a good master subcontract agreement, if you don't have a good trade partner handbook, And if you don't have, if you're not using purchase orders, if you're not locking in and assigning the risk and locking in your profits with your trade partners or subcontractors, then you are at risk for profit bleeds. And that's a gap in your system. And I can tell you, if you want a, if you want a system that you can use for your trade partners, then the best thing that's out there is module number two of the co-construct masterclass that Spencer Paget and I put together. There are six modules in the masterclass, but module number two is a masterclass in and of itself for streamlining trade partner operations. And you're gonna get everything that you need. If you want details on that, you can go to buildermasterclass.com and look for the co-construct masterclass. Number six on this list, and this one's counterintuitive. I get some pushback on this one. It's a little, controversial and it may not apply to everybody, but one of the other underlying root causes behind profit bleeds is doing free estimates. I talk to and work with lots of builders, remodelers, GCs who are spending inordinate amount of time, inordinate amounts of time, wasting ridiculous amounts of time on tire kickers, doing estimates, free design work, free planning, free pre-construction work, 
and it is the root cause of lots of problems. So think about, let's think about the problems that are caused by doing free estimates for just a minute. First of all, you're spending a lot of time, spending a lot of time on estimates that never go anywhere. I remember having an opportunity for a sure thing. This couple contacted me about building a custom home and his name was uh, Terry, was his name. I had blocked it out for years, but it just came back to me. His name was Terry. And Terry and his wife wanted to build a custom home. And they decided that I was the guy. All right, I was in. And we just needed to put some plans together, put the price together, give them a budget, work all the details out. And they started telling me about this house. Like, well, this is two-story. 3,000, 3,500 square foot house. And I'm thinking, wow, these people, they must know, they, they know what they want. And they had pretty high end tastes. He was a pilot. And um, I spent probably 40 hours doing plans. I did the floor plans. I did the estimates. I met with them several times. 40 hours. Gave them the budget, said, here's your cost. It's going to be it was somewhere north of $400,000. And they said, oh, wow, our budget is like 150. And um, that included the land price. And I never called them back again. I, I, I was so annoyed, so frustrated, but it was really my fault because I spent lots of time thinking, oh, this is a sure thing. They want me to do it. They must know what they're talking about. I didn't take the time to qualify them. And I, I wasted so much time on that freaking free estimate. So think about this. What else could you be doing with all that time? How much time did you spend last in the last 30 days doing free estimates or free plans or even just doing site visits? Hey, come out and take a look at this project and tell us what you think. Can we do this? And looking at options and doing revisions and talking to architects about stuff. How much time did you th did you spend on that in the last 30 days? Now multiply that those number of hours times $1,000 because that's how much your, your time is worth. In fact, you can go listen to episode 139 of my podcast and you'll hear 10 things that you can do as a business owner that are worth a thousand bucks an hour. So think about your time in terms of a thousand bucks an hour. There are also some direct costs. If you have salespeople on staff or an estimator who's spending time doing free estimates, then there's a direct cost for those free estimates. They're not free. Free estimates aren't free for anybody except the customer. And then think about the opportunity cost. What if you could take all of that time you spent in the last 30 days that ended up not going anywhere Maybe it was on tire kickers or unqualified leads or people who didn't even own the house or people who were thinking about stuff or they're just using your number to keep their preferred contractor honest. What if you took all of that time and used it toward working with your ideal client, somebody who is qualified, somebody who does want to work with you, somebody who does see the value in what you're doing? Well, the difference between those two situations is opportunity cost. The time you're spending doing free estimates that, that don't go anywhere is extremely, extremely high. It's really painful because you could be spending that time doing lots of other things. Not, not just working with good clients, but what else could you spend that time on? One of my favorite questions to ask people is, if you had four hours a week to spend on something that is super high value for your business, what would you spend it on? four hours a week, uninterrupted, you could work on something super high value, what would you spend that time on? Would it be networking? Would it be running more paid estimates, training your people, building your trade partner network, meeting real estate agents, fishing on your boat, maybe? What would you be doing if you had four hours a week? That's a good question to think about. So now let's talk about when you do get a contract based on a free estimate that you put together quickly, there are a lot of problems that come from this. There are a lot of profit bleeds that come from free estimates. For example, most 
estimates that are put together, let's say remodeling or new home or a tenant improvement project or ground up construction for commercial, whatever the case may be, you don't have time to to plan everything out. You don't have time to make all of the selections and go through submittals, selections, specs. So you have allowances, you have assumptions, you have this estimate that's full of gaps, allowances, assumptions that all have to be vetted out once you sign the contract. There are potential change orders there. There are things that you may be owed change orders for where they, because of the, because of the fact that there wasn't enough time to put together a detailed estimate that closes all of those gaps, there are change orders that have to be dealt with. You may end up paying subs more than you should. I've talked to a lot of remodelers and builders who have, they get a contract, they, they have to hurry up and get started, and then they get invoices in from their subcontractors or trade partners, and they have to argue about price at that point after the work's already done, which completely sucks. Then there are missed expectations from your clients. They say things like, I thought I told you, or you said you would, or I thought this, missed expectations. I thought I was going to get this. I know I've had to miss some expectations because I put together an estimate and then it wasn't completely detailed out what style of window I was going to use. And then I ended up using one type of window because that fit my budget. And that was not the expectation that my customer had and had a pretty uncomfortable conversation about that. So a lot of Think about the tough conversations you have, the uncomfortable conversations you have with customers that start with, I thought I said, or I thought I was getting, or I thought you were going to, or what about this? A lot of those can be traced back to doing free estimates, all right? And I'm working on how to solve this. I'm putting together some training on getting you paid for estimates. Keep an eye out for that. If you're interested in getting an early look at that, then send me an email. I've got a survey for you. Send me an email at support at constructionleadingedge.com and I'll get this survey in your hands and you'll have an opportunity to, to get an early look at that training when it comes out. But uh, send me an email about that if you want to uh, take that survey and get an early look. All right, root cause number seven is left to right thinking. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then go listen to episode 65, which is about right to left thinking. You'll see the difference. I contrast the way most contractors operate, which is left to right, and how most successful businesses operate, how big companies operate, how successful contractors operate. They operate from right to left, which is starting with the end in mind and working backwards. But the left to right thinking is the root cause of a lot of problems. It actually ties into the first thing, which was the as little and as late as possible mindset. That's left to right thinking. Right to left thinking is go to the end, work backwards from there, set milestones, figure out what you want to do, and ask the question, what will it take to make this happen? But go listen to episode 65 for a deep dive on that. Number eight, this one's, this one's a little hard to find. Right? This is one that I've just noticed. It's very subtle. Very few people will come out and say, hey, I have a problem with this. But a few have, and here it is. Number eight is a lack of confidence. A lack of confidence in a lot of things results in profit pleats. And frankly, if you don't solve this, if you don't have confidence and these things that we're going to talk about, then a lot of these other things won't help. Great systems, you could hire, you could find the best system, put it in place, but if you don't have confidence, it's not gonna work. You could hire great people or have great opportunities with people, but if you don't have the confidence that you need, it's not gonna stick. So here we go. Let me run through several things where the, a lack of confidence or a deficiency in confidence exists. Number one, the value that you offer your clients. If you are not confident 
in the value you offer your customers, then you will get into a bidding war with yourself. You will negotiate on price and you will not charge what you're worth. So what am I talking about when I say a bidding war with yourself? Here's what that looks like. Imagine you're putting together an estimate. Think about the last estimate you put together and you've put the, the last of the costs in there. You look at the bottom number, the subtotal or the total, and then your immediate response is what? If you're like 90 to 95% of the people I ask that question to at my live events, they say things like, that's too much. They're never gonna pay that much. That's too high. How can I charge that? I've gotta go find some way to, to bring it in lower than that. What's that based on? Certainly not a, a, an overabundance of confidence in your number. It's based on a lack of confidence. It's based on the story that you're telling yourself and this voice that we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. So the lack of value you offer your clients is, is a big problem. The lack of confidence in the value you offer your potential or current employees. If you're a small business owner, you may think, why would somebody want to work here? Why would a, I need a good project manager or I need a good superintendent, but why would they ever want to work here? I don't offer this. I can't do this. Fill in the blank with all of these other excuses. But you need to be confident in the value that you offer your employees. You may think, well, I can't pay them what the big boys pay them. It's not all about money. There are a lot of people jumping ship right now, leaving big contractors so that they can work for a small company, so that they're a person and not just a number, so they, have, they can have a better experience at work, so they can build cool stuff, so they don't have to travel. Lots of things that you can offer, a lot of value that you can potentially offer that has nothing to do with compensation. The next one, the next uh, confidence deficiency is um, tied into an old Burger King slogan. If you remember a few years back, Burger King's slogan was, have it your way. Well, if your approach to how you build your, your projects is, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Client, you can have it your way, then you do not have confidence in your systems. You need to have confidence. A lot of contractors lack confidence in their systems and processes. If you are a general contractor, you need to be specific and lead your clients. This is how we do this. This is our process. We do these things every day. This is our process. If you're a subcontractor, lead your GCs. I've got a uh, a good friend of mine who's a client who's an electrical contractor and he has um, he told me he, his backlog is so stacked up that he started to send out these ridiculous demands for general contractors that he's working with saying you have to have this and this and this and this and this before we'll even put your project on the schedule and his intent was he was trying to be difficult to work with so he wouldn't have to tell them no Thomas, this is you, if you're listening. And he actually had GCs contact him back and say, man, this is great. Thank you so much for being organized. This is great. We, we, we're really looking forward to working with you. So lead your general contractors if you're a subcontractor. Set expectations. Tell them your process. Tell them this is what needs to be in place. This is how we work. Be specific and lead them. If you're a supplier, then lead your customers. You have a specific process. They don't understand all the inner workings of the supply chain. Tell them the process. You're not freaking Burger King, all right? If you're a designer, same thing. Have a process, lead your people, tell them this is our process, this is how we do it, set expectations, set bookmarks, or set bookends, rather, on the design process, set up milestones, be specific. You need to be confident in your numbers. A lot of people have a lack of confidence in their numbers. They wonder, am I making money? Am I doing the right thing? Should I be charging more? Am I charging the right margin? Um, am, 
am I charging enough money? And you need to have confidence in your numbers. And a lot of that lack of confidence becomes comes from a lack of clarity. They can't even see it. They don't know. They don't have the right reporting in place. And I can tell you, if you're if you're a small construction business owner and you need a good system, if you are doing your own bookkeeping or you feel like you're flying your plane in the dark with no instruments and no visibility and you don't know if you're about to crash or not financially, then you need to get some system in place. And my recommendation is the apparatus contractor services team. They are an outsourced bookkeeper. They'll handle your bookkeeping. They'll do it way better than you can do it. And then it'll free you up to do other stuff. And you can have confidence in your numbers. If you want more information on the apparatus team, go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash headache. You can learn about how you can outsource or offload all of those headaches to them. The last lack of confidence that people have is lack of confidence in yourself as a leader. There are questions like, do I have what it takes? Can I do this? Do I have the chops to do this? Why are these people following me? Am I in over my head? Am I going to screw it up again? Am I going to screw it up again? These are things that people deal with. It comes from a lack of confidence. And here's where uh, I mentioned this voice that attacks our confidence. And I happened to pick up an article in a psychology magazine a few months ago, and it was about this voice that we all have and has become very apparent to me after working with hundreds of construction business owners. And this article called that voice the inner critic, the inner critic. We all have it. And here's what it said, quote, the paradox of the inner critic is that it attacks and undermines you in order to protect you from the shame of failure. Let me read that again. Listen very closely. The paradox of the inner critic is that it attacks and undermines you in order to protect you from the shame of failure. So those questions, do I have what it takes? Todd, are you going to screw this up again? Todd, how can you possibly do this? Todd, what's going to happen if this? Todd, what if, what if, what if, what if? That's the inner critic. And it sees these things as a threat. All right. It can't tell the difference between a charging rhinoceros and somebody saying something that hurts your feelings. All right. The inner critic is trying to protect you from the shame of failure. It's trying to protect you from something. And it will say all sorts of things to talk you out of trying these things. So you have to understand the inner critic is going to be there. Sometimes it might be helpful. Most of the time, it's trying to protect you from the thing that you should do. And here's what I found. There will be resistance. There will be obstacles. There will be difficulties. And use resistance as a compass, okay? Because resistance is a symptom of doing something worthwhile. So if you're going in a direction and whether it's you're planning to, you're trying to start your business, trying to grow your business, trying to do something positive, trying to become a better leader, trying to improve in some way, trying to get in better shape, whatever it might be, you got to understand your inner critic is going to flare up because it sees this new thing you're doing as an opportunity for failure. And it wants to undermine you to protect you from failure. So that means you're on the right track if the inner critic is getting loud or if there's resistance. So use resistance as a compass. All right, so those are eight underlying root causes, a couple of layers below profit bleeds. Here's what I want you to think about, all right? We're going to land on a challenge. This might be interesting information, but it's going to be really helpful if you actually do something with it, if you take some action, which I'll get to in a moment. Here's what I want you to think about. I want you to pick the most troubling one, all right? Pick the most troubling one. Is it a lack of confidence? Is it the gaps in your systems, doing free estimates? Are you a micromanager? Do you have a just do you have a poverty mindset? Is it a scarcity mindset? 
you have the as little and as late as possible mindset, I want you to think about which of those is the most troubling for you, the thing that you really, that really annoys you, the thing that bothers you. And then I want you to think about what would it be like to solve that? What would it be like if, let's say you have the scarcity mentality, what if you could eliminate that anxiety? What if you saw the good in every situation instead of always thinking that bad things are coming? What if you no longer always waited for the other shoe to drop? What if you could trust people? What if you saw the good in people instead of the scarcity? If you're a micromanager, what if, imagine if the people on your team and the people around you were taking more ownership and they're actually doing better work with less involvement from you and you weren't threatened by them. What if you could actually be happy about somebody's success? If you'd like to put systems in place, if you would like to have confidence in your systems, think about what would it be like for your business or your projects to run like a well-oiled machine? What would that be like? What would that feel like to, to have that sense of accomplishment knowing, man, I did this. I put this system in place. This thing is working, and now I can go fill in the blank. Maybe you can take a long weekend. Maybe you can take a vacation. Maybe you with good systems in place, you can actually hire a project manager into your system now. What if you could get paid for estimates? What would that be like? Think about that. Not wasting time with tire kickers, feeling like you're actually getting paid for your time, and what would that do for you? And then confidence. What would it feel like to, to go into every situation with more confidence? To be able to address a, a customer and say, this is how we do it. This is our process. We're not freaking Burger King. You don't get it your way. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. This is why you hired us, because we have a solid process. What would that do for you to have that kind of confidence? Here's my challenge for you. For that thing you picked, select a habit that will help you punch that thing in the face. Select a simple habit, something that you can do every day that will get you started. I'm talking about micro wins. If you wanted to run a 5k race in three months, then my recommendation would be to put your running shoes by your bed. Micro steps, baby steps, micro wins, something that is completely in your control. What is one little thing you can do every day for the next seven days? Because it comes down to habits, okay? It's not enough to know that you're supposed to do something or that you want it. Desire is not enough. It's about habits. So my challenge for you is select a habit that will help you with that most troubling thing and do it every day for the next seven days. Consider it a seven day new habit challenge. And if you don't know where to start, you have no idea, and that just overwhelms you, then start with gratitude. I'll give you an off the shelf habit. Every morning, as soon as you get up, Spend three minutes writing what you are grateful for. Simple things, small things, big things, whatever it is, just do it for three minutes. Set a timer on your phone, grab a pen and a piece of paper, a journal if you want, and spend three minutes every day, first thing in the morning, writing what you're grateful for. Do that for seven days. It'll feel wonky. It may feel like a waste of time, but I'm telling you, it'll change your life. Okay couple of other resources I want to tell you about. I mentioned some of these. If you are a builder, remodeler, general contractor, then, and if you want to put systems in place, if you want a system that will help you run your trade partner operation, if you want to be able to schedule your projects, if you want to have visibility into your financials, then my number one recommendation is a system called co-construct. I know the people, I know their system. I, I, I received a note from a co-construct user recently who said, I was a co-construct user and then I left and I went to their competitor and then their competitor did such a bad job of handling customer communication that I came back to co-construct and here's what they said. The competitor was concerned about their bottom line, but co-construct was concerned about my bottom line. So if you want a system that will help you 
Run your entire business. If you're a builder, remodeler, general contractor, go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash co-construct. And if you're already a co-construct user and you heard about them from me, then send me an email because I want to get a bunch of templates into your hands. If you heard about it from me, then you earned a bunch of templates that will help you get up the learning curve. Send me an email, support at constructionleadingedge.com and say, give me those templates. The other thing is I've got a bunch of new resources coming out at buildermasterclass.com. I have the co-construct masterclass where you'll learn how to maximize bottom line profitability if you're a builder or remodeler. And then I'll show you, I and my friend Spencer Padgett will show you how to do it using co-construct. I also am working on partnerships with other software companies to do the same thing, show you how to maximize bottom line profitability for say commercial general contractors. That's coming out in the not too distant future. There's also a mastermind group for co-construct users, live events, but go to buildermasterclass.com. And if you're a service provider, if you have a, a group of builders or type of you're a subcontract, if you work with a bunch of subcontractors or you're like, I would love to put together a masterclass for my people, then you let me know. I'm, I'm working on creating a, an entire curriculum of masterclasses to help contractors get better. So one last thing, if you get value out of this podcast, if you could do two things for me, if you could one, take 60 seconds and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or the podcast player of your choice, that would be fantastic. And if you could share this podcast with somebody that you think would get value out of it, send them a text, send them an email, say, you got to check this out, share this podcast link with them. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much for listening. Pick that most troubling underlying issue, put some habits in place, take action, implement. That's where you're going to start to change your life and your business. If there's anything I can do for you, you know where to find me. Thanks so much. My name is Todd DeWalt. I'll see you next time.